Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I am Dan and today we are joined by George Gway, the host and founder of Just Say Gway, a sports show on the internet. George is a graduate of Providence College who initially started his business by aligning his passion for sports with media and has since published over 100 episodes on YouTube, hosted guests like Kyle Draper, Coach Lehman of PC Hockey and the assistant coach of the LA Lakers, and recently signed his first sponsorship deal with the Edge Sports Group. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Dan Anderson Podcast. I, of course, am Dan, and this is a podcast about sharing the stories and lessons learned by entrepreneurs. And today we are joined by George Gway. George, great to have you. Thanks for having me, Dan. You are currently the host and founder of Just Say Gway, which is a sports show where you know athletes, coaches, and media professionals join you to talk about their experience. Beyond that, what can you tell the audience about who you are and really what Just Say Gway is all about? A little bit of a backstory, and obviously, like you said, we grew up playing sports together. You know, I grew up still in Bedford, Massachusetts. I went through all four of the schools, graduated from Bedford High, uh, went to Providence College, I was a business management major. I started Just Say Gway. I was taking time off from school for a year um, and wanted to do something that I would enjoy, Um, and talking about sports is one of those things, and I couldn't have found a better situation than uh, with Greg Dolan, who was my high school journalism teacher and he allowed me to launch the show and you know that's where it all started and are you have you always been interested in sports i would say so um whether it's playing or even talking about them ever since i was a little kid i was always hooked on watching sports but you know enjoyed playing them especially growing up in a you know small town uh, like bedford where playing sports is an option for pretty much everyone who wants to and what's great about the town and if you play sports is they don't really have a lot of cuts for teams it's kind of open to all. Uh, so it was a great sports culture, especially I think what made me interested in sports was the run that Boston sports has had the last 20 years. Um, and it's become just a big passion. Now, you've done over 100 episodes on the Just Say Gway video series, the, the episodes that you've done, which is pretty crazy, and I'm sure you're proud of that number as well. What is something that you learned throughout those 100 episodes, and how did you first align sports with media? Um, well, I think, like you said, I've always loved to talk about sports. One of the things I learned over the last 100 episodes is that um, you really got to put a lot of time into it for it to be successful. You know, when it first started out, it was a show that was just me giving my opinions on sports and what was happening. Uh, and I think I became a good host by just continuing to do show after show. And that eventually led me to doing the interviews. I can't believe it's been 100 episodes, but... Crazy. Yeah, I think it's also just a big reason that I got to 100 is just after every time I finished an episode, I want to do another one. Uh, And I think that's a big key for someone that wants to launch their show. You have to keep wanting to come back. Now, how did you initially make that connection between sports and media, though, right? You talked about Greg Dolan, Bedford TV a little bit, and taking a break from school. Did it kind of come out of nowhere? Where did you make that connection? You know, like I said, I was a business major in the beginning of college and throughout college. I never really had an interest in media. When I was at home, I saw a couple shows at Bedford TV and I figured, you know, I think I can do that as well. But I never thought that it would lead to all of this. Um, I just kind of thought about it as something I would enjoy doing while spending time away from school. Um, and it just led to a passion. I do think that Um, When I was younger, though, I thought I had somewhat of a talent for this. Um, I did broadcast the high school basketball games with Sean Glasby for one year and then one year by myself. So I think I had something in me, but uh, I think when I had all that free time, the connection to media made me really want to do it more. Yeah. And what was the start like, too? Because when you jump into something, I don't know if you ever expected to have a 100 plus episodes was it nerve-wracking in the beginning? Did you did you feel confident 100% when you first started? I felt confident mostly because I think the people that were helping me with the show, Bedford TV, made it more relaxing. Um, you know, they took care of the extracurricular stuff that I didn't want to do or could mm-hmm. do, like the promoting it and editing it. You know, I really just showed up and started talking and then went home. Um, so I was lucky to have that situation. So, Awesome. And... When you go to set up your next meeting, and we'll get to, to you know, kind of competition behind setting up multiple meetings in advance, what kind of research do you have to do beforehand? Or do you know a lot of this stuff that you're going to be talking about before you go into the meeting? 
So I think whenever I was interviewing someone at Providence, I kind of knew a lot about them. You know, if I wanted to discuss things that happened to them before they came to school, that requires research. I would say as the show expanded to people more so outside of Providence, the more research has to be done. Mm -hmm. Just because I don't know them at all, uh, especially if they go to a way different school. I don't know where they grew up or you know, what teams they played on before. So was, I think also the research has become more great because I want to get on bigger guests each time. Um, so one thing I do look out a lot to s determine my guests or who I want to come on the show is I look at the mock drafts for college sports um, because I think that's who you know who's going to be the next you know big star in the league or something like that. Or uh, for hockey, what I do is I do a lot of research on who's the, who's the top prospects um, for each team because one of the things I want to do on the show is get people on before they you know, hopefully go big and take the next step. Absolutely. And one of the other impressive things, aside from the 100 episodes you've done too, is the sponsorship deal that you just landed. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and how you got it? Yeah, so that was one of the things I definitely did not think would ever happen. So I was with Edge Sports Group, uh, and you know in Bedford we have the Edge where people can go play hockey. Uh, it's where Bedford hockey plays. There's you know, soccer and lacrosse and the bubble, and it's privately funded. So that was done with Brian DeVellis, who uh, is the CEO of Edge Sports. So what that company did was establish that private facility in Bedford, uh, and now they have about five facilities in uh, Essex, Braintree, Worcester, and Wellesley. And uh, I'm sure you, you know, knew the name Stephen DeVellis, his son, was in my grade and you know we lost a bit of contact he went to Belmont High uh in middle school so I didn't really see him again and you know how it is in Bedford if you know their kids you kind of know their parents too so I didn't see Brian for years uh and then I started posting my videos on LinkedIn and that immediately drew interest so I was glad I was able to work it out okay so did you reach out to them at first or did they see your content and say hey George let's do something uh it was more so Brian DeVellis I think he was very intrigued by what he was seeing, but it really wasn't that hard for him to want to make this happen because he knew me since I was a little kid, and I think he knows what I'm about. Right. And then what kind of work goes into a sponsorship deal? What are you required to do? Do you run ads on every episode before or after you talk to your guest? So we haven't talked about it fully, what is expected of me. I know that I'm going to have to okay. say, you know, this episode is brought to you by Edge Sports Group. Um, what they want to do is have me promote their facilities and also do a podcast for their show talking about their facilities and, you know, what makes them so great. And I'd obviously have to wear a company merchandise during the podcast. Uh, and they're hoping that, you know, some of that, they have professional athletes train at their uh, private facilities. Um, Jack Eichel trains at the one in Essex County. A few Patriot players train at the one in Wellesley. So they're hoping that if, you know, if I do some good things for them, they'll allow me to get those guys on their show, on my show. And that'd be a huge thing. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about purpose and vision because when we talked last time, you were mentioning that you really do have a plan in terms of what you want to be and who you want to be. Who is that person and what is Just Segway in getting you to that place? So what I want to become as a sports analyst, whether that's being an analyst after the games or even a color commentator or someone on the radio. Um, I did a lot of those things at school, such as I was a, a radio broadcaster for the PC uh, radio for the hockey games. I hosted my own radio show with my friends. Um, so I think the hard thing is to understand is that when I first started doing it, like I said, it was something that I thought I'd be good at. And I think I kind of had that moment where I thought, you know, you know, maybe I can do this um, as a career. And I think what that moment was is when I had Kyle Draper on the show because after I watched it, I felt like I fit in with him. You know, I'm not saying I'm, you know, at his level right now in terms of uh, how good I can I am at this, but it went very smoothly. That was the moment where I said, okay, um, I can really go far with this. Um, I think another moment like that was when I hosted the PC Hockey Coach. Um, and the reason for that... Coach Lehman? Is be Coach Lehman, yes. And the reason for that is because the first two guests I had on at school were my friends. And that was great because they got the ball rolling. However, I felt so comfortable um, and it was all natural because they were my friends. Uh, Colin Miller and Andrew Fonts. Uh, Colin plays soccer at PC and Andrew plays basketball. Coach Lehman was really the first guest at Providence that 
I didn't know at all. I knew he knew me because I was a big fan of the team and I went to a lot of Boston away games. But I think once I completed those two episodes, it made me feel like, you know, I can interview anybody. I can fit in with, you know, these people who are so successful at what they do. Yeah, I mean, those are pretty big names, right? Kyle Draper, everyone sees him on TV, especially if you're from Boston and, and Coach Lehman. You, you told me a little bit more about that story, which we'll touch on later. Are there any other guests that you've had on the show where you're like, wow, this is really impressive. This is exciting for me. Yes, I mean, obviously every guest is very important. I'm hoping that they will achieve you know, a lot in their sports and uh, they've helped the show grow tremendously. I'd say uh, two guests. I would go with Grant Ament. And he was the number one pick this year in the Premier Lacrosse League. Uh, and he's supposed to be one of the next best players. Uh, he set the Big Ten all-time record in points for lacrosse at Penn State. And I really think he's going to be the next star. And that was a big episode. And it was all due to my friend Luke O'Grady at school who played high school lacrosse with him. And that kind of set it up. But, you know, I'd say the uh, biggest one. I was like, wow, this is a big deal, was when I had the Lakers assistant coach on, Mike Penberthy. You know, so cool. He did it. Yeah, he did it about two weeks after they won the championship. You know, people didn't really know the name because he's a, he's a coach. But when you think about it, you know, he works on a day-to-day basis with LeBron and Anthony Davis. He played with Kobe Bryant and Shaq. So, you know, this guy's seen it all. And he's coming from a distance uh, all the way out in L.A., you know, in the shows in Bedford and – Yeah, I think also because there's no connection with him. It was just to reach out and, you know, really thankful it worked out. It seems like Jesse Gue and and things that you've done on your own are really starting to take off. Has your kind of goal or mindset changed after you've done the last hundred episodes in terms of like, is George going to do this on his own or is he going to go to a network? Has that plan changed? I hope it leads to a network. I hope it leads to a network. You know, I did get, I was interning in NBC and that kind of fell apart because of the, of COVID. Um, you know, I was there when the NBA and NHL shut down in one night and that was really hectic and, you know, who knows when they'll be offering those type of jobs again. Uh, right. I know that if I want to get to a level like a Kyle Draper, um, I have to be in the production side for a bit of time. So, you know, hopefully land a job in that somewhere down the road. Uh, but, you know, I think as, the bigger the names have gotten, the more pressure there is on me to keep getting big names. One of the challenges I face is after every episode, I want to you know, ask these pro athletes, can you promote this episode? But they can't because they have media rules. And I know that if you know, a pitcher on the White Sox or, or the Lakers assistant coach, if they, if they uh, promoted it, you know, thousands of people would see it. And the challenge is I always want to ask people, hey, do you know anyone that you think would like doing this. And I think that was easier when I was in college because I was interviewing a lot of pre-professional athletes, um, not many professional athletes. So it was like I was talking to someone, you know, my own age. And I think, you know, when you want to ask the Lakers coach, hey, do you think anyone would want to do this? The first thing that's going to come to his mind is this kid's asking for LeBron or Anthony Davis. So um, I think the bigger the name, the harder to expand the network is after that. Now, let's talk and switch gears a little bit, because I know you mentioned the NBC Sports Boston internship, right? Let's talk a little bit about that process for you to apply, because you said you you applied multiple times, and and it took three times to eventually land that job. What was that process like, and and what did you learn from that? Yeah, so obviously it was a little discouraging getting uh, turned down a couple times. It was well worth it, you know, being able to get into the doors there. You know, but I think what I learned is that when you get turned down from one place, keep trying. And when you try that second time, you really got to bring it back uh, even better. And I think the reason that I didn't get it was mostly because my show was very one dimensional. And also the fact that, you know, I didn't major in journalism in college. And, you know, all the other interns I worked with, they were journalism majors. The, The other production people, they were journalism majors. So I think that was a challenge. But I think, like I said, the show was one dimensional. It was only Providence people. And I think being in the Cape League and getting those connections on the show and athletes that played in that league, I think that's what made the difference. Right. How do you get yourself from out of that rejection state to wanting to go back and and apply again? I knew every time I went in for the interview and the, and the, 
man who, who was turning me down at times from the internship, he was thinking that I was close. Uh, you know, I was always in the final rounds of interviews. So I think given the fact that I was one of the last one cut both times, meant that I was close and you just had to keep trying. Let's talk about your experience with uh, the PC hockey coach, Coach Lehman. We briefly touched on this, and, and that was one of the episodes where you said, you know, that was important for the Just Segway podcast. What was it like going into that meeting, and how did you deal with the nerves that you were telling me about? Coach Lehman is um, one of the best, if not the best hockey coach for college in the country. Brought a national championship to Providence, has coached plenty of NHL players. Like I said, I didn't know him like I knew Colin and um, Andrew Fonts. It was nerve-wracking, you know, when I go into his office, he wasn't in there yet, and you just see the trophies and the signed jerseys of the pros, and you can see the ice from his office. And I'm just like, whoa, this is a really intense, you know, place I'm in. Uh, it was really good that he's a nice guy, and he made the, the process more comfortable. But, yeah, I mean, when you kind of step in there, it felt a little bit different, especially since... The first couple of interviews, you know, I just did it either in the library or the athletes' uh, dorm room. Coach Lehman, I, I can understand that feeling because myself being a college athlete playing D2 soccer for Bentley, I can remember those first meetings, not necessarily looking to interview the coach, but, you know, looking to, to get on the team and advocate for myself as an athlete. It's the same feeling, right? You're, you're kind of on their terms. They're busy people. And when you do get time with them, I actually showed up early to that meeting as well. And it's like, where am I? What am I doing? And how do I, you know, sell myself essentially? So I can I can hear that. Let's talk about competition because I know you mentioned some of the media guys who are, you know, applying for similar internships with you. You also mentioned a lot of these media majors at, at PC are also going out and interviewing coaches, athletes as well. How do you compete with other folks out there with a media background? Yeah, I think honestly the biggest competition is myself. Like, you know, just keep it going. But I like to think I set an example because I see a few kids now at PC setting up shows and interviewing people. I think they had an advantage over me because I didn't interview a Providence athlete until I was a junior in, in college, and some of them are starting out as freshmen. And I do think that sports are getting better at Providence College. At PC, there's no media major or communications, so we're all in the same pool. And I think I was the first non-media major at NBC because no one else I interned with was uh, anything except journalism. The biggest thing is, you know, I'm not trying to outwork other people, but just keep on, you know, continuing it myself. Yeah, but one of the things that you mentioned to me was that you actually schedule at least three meetings in advance to make sure that you're keeping track with your progression. What is that like? And, and tell me a little bit about what that means to you. I just like to have a lot of interviews set up in advance. I don't want to go in a drought of, you know, two to three weeks where there's no one on the show. I only want there to be a drought when I'm saying it because there'll be one, you know, that I'm not doing it for a bit. And a lot of these guys just don't know what's going to happen with their schedule. Given the fact that some of them are in season, things come up. Someone says they're going to do an episode at 730 at night and they get a scheduled lift or practice goes longer. You always got to be prepared to have someone on and... Also, I think it just makes it more exciting that I have someone ready to go right after the episode ends. Because like I said, I want to, I want to be able to come back to wanting to do it again. Having someone right, ready to go makes you want to do that. Keeps the ball rolling. Well, George, we're coming down to about time, but we do have a few minutes left for some of your final remarks and, and really closing out this, this podcast episode, which has been great so far. But what is something that you learned during your entrepreneurial journey that has helped to get you where you are today? What's a piece of advice that you have for someone who wants to try something on their own? Everyone is reachable. I don't want to say LeBron James or Connor McDavid or Tom Brady reachable, but just shoot, shoot them a message. Uh, one of the things I like to do is, you know, if I can't get to the person directly, I reach out to a lot of their foundations or Go on their pictures and see who they're tagging and reach out to them. And I think one of the other things is just build a website. That's definitely opened up doors because when I applied to Northwestern for grad school, they were able to see my website. When I applied to DraftKings, they were able to see my website. And, you know, you can take time off. You know, I, I went a few months without doing it, you know, focus on school. And the reason why I did was because I kind of felt helpless because there was a time when, the athletic department didn't want me to interview the athletes and I really had to work to get their trust. 
But if you're going to take time off, just know in your head that uh, someone else is out there working as well. I'm not saying you have to be 24-7, you know, Mamba mentality, working all the time, getting up at 5 a.m. to do this, you know. I try and spend at least an hour a day on this, not much too later. Uh, or that's looking up the drafts or, you know, teammates that might have done interviews in the past. Also, I'd say if you're trying to get people on, figure out who they know as well because everyone knows someone. And if you go to a Division One school, they definitely played with someone good as well. Um, especially, like, I benefited from PC Hockey that everyone on that team played with someone good on their former team and, you know, numerous good teammates. So, you know, your network is bigger than you think. And when you talk about vision, it seems to really guide the episodes that you do with Jesse Gue. How does that propel you forward and where do you want to be in the next three to five years? I'd love to have more sponsorships. Consistently have pro athletes on each show. You know, I would love to have a current all-star in at least one of the four major sports. Um, and hopefully be back at NBC one day in five years. You know, I know it's kind of hard because it's just three years ago I was at Bedford TV and I didn't think it, was, it wasn't going anywhere. So I think partially I don't know where it's going to be in three or five years. But um, hopefully more sponsors, that'd be great. Um, more high-profile athletes. Um, hopefully a place that sees this and says, okay, let's bring them in. Really cool story. And this resonates with me because I'm doing a similar thing, not necessarily with sports or athletes, but for folks like you who are going out on their own and, you know, taking the entrepreneurial journey. So really cool conversation today. George, thank you again for the time. Where can the viewers, the listeners find you on the internet? You can follow me at George M. Guay on Instagram. That's where I post most of my shows. YouTube channel is Just Say Guay. www.justsayguay.com. Awesome. Well, George, this has been awesome. I do really appreciate the time, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Dan.